All right. So hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the first lecture on US University admissions. Um, if you don't know me already, my name is Megan Halverson. I am the academic counselor at Tutoring Club at Times Square Center. And I also used to be an international admissions and study abroad advisor at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. So I come from a background of international education. Um, and I had quite a few students um, that are coming from this region of the world. So I'm going to try to touch on some of the questions that they had um, regarding several different topics like finance, academics, and general life in the United States. Okay. So first things first, um, I just wanted to go over a couple of things before we begin. Um, so this lecture will last approximately 45 minutes to 50 minutes. Um, and then afterwards, I'm going to invite everybody to do a Q&A session. So if you have any questions throughout the lecture, I do request that you write them down or keep track of them um, because I'm not going to um, stop, the or stop the lecture um, to address specific questions. So write them down and then at the end, I will be able to address whatever questions you might have. Um, now muting, I do request that everybody stay muted throughout the lecture as well. Um, I do want to make sure that I can proceed smoothly, so please keep yourself on mute. Um, like I said, we'll have Q&A at the end, and I will also share um, useful resources for you guys. So not just our information, but um, websites and other resources that you can utilize for things like scholarships and general information about different institutions in the United States. Okay, so the topics that we're going to cover today, um, the first one is why to study at a US university. So I'll just give a brief oversight of why it is a unique experience for students to study here um, versus studying in UAE, Europe, or elsewhere. Um, how to apply. So this is actually kind of a lengthy process and I'll go over um, as many details as possible. Um, academics, so what you can expect from um, the academic component of your study in the United States. Um, I'll touch a bit on finances and I'll touch a bit on campus culture as well. Um, now, a lot of the topics that I'm going to discuss, I'll give you the generals of all of these, but I won't go into very finite specifics because it is difficult um, to give one explanation of a university like NYU, for example, and then go to another one like UCLA. Those are two different universities on two different coasts with different eligibility requirements um, and different expectations for each. So I will go over the questions you should start asking yourself. And then if you have specific questions, you can either ask me at the end or I would recommend that you reach out to the specific institution that you're looking to attend. Okay, so first things first, why to study in the United States? This is a topic that I could really go on and on about. Um, my studies in the United States were honestly the best four years of my life. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the academic factors and the personal factors that should go into your decision to study in the US. All right, so the first item is that when you study in the United States, you could be connecting with some of the world's um, top researchers. For example, um, if you look at the, a couple of different fields like linguistics, forensic psychology, um, the forefathers of those uh, fields actually still teach at universities in the United States. So if you're interested in linguistics, um, the man that is considered to be the father of modern linguistics, Noam Chomsky, is actually still a professor at MIT. Um, the originators of forensic psychology still also are professors while they are jointly members of the FBI. Um, so you could be working with people that are not only um, at the very top of the field, but that also um, have insight into what it's like to work outside of research in that field as well. Um, this should actually be pretty well known by everybody, but the United States does have the world's best universities. So if you look at a list of the top universities on the planet, um, the top three are Harvard, MIT, and Stanford, um, all of which are on the Northeast Coast, two of which, Harvard and MIT, are about two miles apart from each other. Um, so we do have the world's best universities. And as a result, um, degrees that you receive from universities in the US will be largely accepted and recognized uh, worldwide. 
So for example, if you're looking to get a job in Europe, if you're looking to get a job in UAE, if you're looking to get a job in Latin America, um, a degree from the United States is going to be a huge asset to your resume. Now this is something, the next point is something that I will go over in more detail later, um, but there is the possibility of something called OPT or CPT. OPT is what we call optional practical training and CPT is curricular practical training. These are work opportunities. Um, they are opportunities where you can get paid to work in the field of your study, either before or after graduation. I'll cover more of that later. And we also provide teaching assistantships, which again, I will talk about later. Um, so flexibility in academics is another huge asset of study in the United States. Um, unlike the UK, when you study in the United States, your first year is really dedicated to foundation studies. Um, so you take what are called general education requirements, and this would be an, anything from mathematics to natural science to um, politics and culture lessons that you're going to need in order to become a truly cultured, um, well-rounded academic global citizen. Um, now, the last topic is that you can also pursue a graduate degree. So there are a lot of students in the United States, um, they come as an undergraduate, and they decide that they want to go right into their graduate degree. Um, so they actually don't even need to leave the country, they can apply while they're still pursuing their graduate or undergraduate, and then they can roll right into their graduate degree. Okay, now here comes some of the personal factors. Um, these are a little bit more fun than the academic factors, um, but there is a lot of culture, there is a lot to do in the United States, and this is one of the main things that attracts people for travel, but it can be a huge benefit to you if you're studying in the United States as well. Um, so we all know that the United States has um, some of the most recognizable entertainment on the planet. Um, a lot of music, art, film, sports originated in the United States. So a couple of examples that I have here. Um, salsa, for example, originated in New York. Country music, hip hop and R&B, jazz, those are all from the United States and have since become global phenomenon. Um, we also have American sports. Um, maybe you're not as familiar with American sports as you are with, say, um, football but they are extremely popular and um, a huge uh, attraction for most people in the United States. Uh, we also obviously are the world's main hub for film as well. So, all right. So another reason that it can be personally attractive to study in the United States is that the United States is huge. And from one coast to the next, you can find the tropics, you can find deserts, you can find snowy mountains, you name it, you can find it in the US. So I put a couple of pictures here, um, some of which might be recognizable, some of which not so much. Um, this right here is a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. This picture right here I added because it's where I'm from. This is a picture of um, Wisconsin in the fall, it's very beautiful. Um, New York City, this is Antelope Canyon in Utah, um, which is a tourist attraction and a nature trail. Hawaii, and of course, Disney World. So a lot of nature, a lot of travel, and most students that do go to the United States end up spending their spring breaks, their winter breaks, even weekends trying to travel from one city or one coast to the next. Um, and another benefit is actually that you will have access to countries as well that you've never been to, um, or that have taken um, in the past too long for you to really consider as international travel. Um, so if you're studying in the US and you are really interested in Latin American culture, you can fly to Mexico or drive to Mexico. Um, you can go to Cuba, Canada, um, so parts of the world that you might never have had access to, you will if you study in the US. Not to mention the fact that we have what could be considered about 50 small countries all jam-packed into one. So. All right, so the next um, asset is that you have endless chances to network in the United States. Um, Americans are very open people, they're very social, they love to talk, and they love to network. So the best way for you to find professional and academic opportunities is through conversation. 
Um, you might meet somebody out for coffee one day. Um, you might even just bump into someone you don't even know, make their acquaintance, and you never know if that person could be a professor at the next university, if that person could be a hiring manager at the dream job you've been looking at. Um, it is very common for um, people that are looking for jobs to use networking um, rather than, let's say, um, just job websites in order to pursue professional opportunities. Um, opportunities, so this is another thing that most people think of uh, when they think of the US, they consider it the land of opportunity, and this is in large part actually true. So there are a lot of people that start with their undergraduate degrees, um, so they start small and you never know, they could make it all the way to the top um, to a CEO position. It is very common. And in the United States, it's more based on merit and work ethic um, rather than nationality or how much money you have. Um, so it really is um, the land of opportunity. It is a place where if you put in the efforts, you can definitely make it. Um, and endless choices. So this is something that I find really unique about the United States. And I do see some of this in Dubai as well. But in the United States, because we have so many people from so many different places, you have endless choices for pretty much anything. You name it, you can find it in the US, particularly in bigger cities. Um, so if you want to eat Thai food at three o'clock in the morning, you'll find Thai food at three o'clock in the morning. Um, if you are from Ivory Coast and your mother tongue is Malenke and you want to find somebody else that speaks Malenke, you will find somebody else that speaks Malenke. Um, so the Un United States really is um, such a diverse and unique culture in that aspect. Now, um, that leads me to my next point. Um, this is something that I think is really important um, when talking about study in the United States, <clears throat> especially for international students. So a lot of people, especially with the news that's been going on lately, tend to think of the United States as an exclusive culture, but that's simply not true. Um, don't let the news fool you. The news tends to blow everything out of proportion. Um, but one of the most unique qualities about the United States is that it's diverse. And it's something that I cherish a lot about my country is that the United States has people from all over the world, people that speak every different language, that come from all different professional and academic walks of life. And you will find people that wholeheartedly want to get to know you, um, wholeheartedly want to help you out. Um, so diversity is something that um, you won't have to worry about. A lot of people think that if they study abroad in the United States, that they might run into discrimination, xenophobia. Um, and typically, if you study abroad in a big city like New York, Chicago, LA, um, you will not run across so many people that are going to be ready to discriminate. And specifically, if you're on a university campus, it's very rare that you're going to find narrow-minded people. This is when people start to open up. They start to experience the world. And um, university campuses tend to be, in each city, the most diverse part of each city. Um, so it is really unique. Um, and I encourage everyone to look into this rather than reading Fox News and what they have to say about diversity. Okay. Now I just added this picture because I thought it was kind of funny, but there are very common stereotypes in the United States or about Americans and not all of them are true. Um, so one of the most common that I got specifically from my female international students was that we are all overweight and that if you stay in the United States, you might also become overweight. This is a lie. So one thing is that portion sizes in the United States are very large. But it's just about moderation, okay? So just as you would moderate your eating habits here, you moderate them there. There's a lot of healthy food options. We don't eat cheeseburgers for breakfast. Um, so you will find something that works for you. Um, you are unwelcome as a non-citizen. So this goes back to the diversity claim. Um, but as a non-citizen, I can guarantee that there are going to be more people that want to know who you are, where you come from, what language you speak, what religion you practice than people that are going to discriminate against you for it. So even people that are politically on the right, um, they, I know that they would very gladly welcome you in for dinner. 
um, they would probably not discriminate, again, as you probably see in the news. Another common stereotype um, that I would like to sway people against is that the United States is unsafe. Um, I have traveled quite a bit and the United States is no different. Big cities in the United States are no different than if you were going to travel to, for example, if you're going to go to Madrid, Chicago is no different than Madrid in that you have to be careful. Um, it's not like Dubai where you can leave a cell phone at a restaurant and then three hours later come back and it's still there. You have to be more careful in the United States. Um, but it isn't, as you see in this picture, full of guns. Um, it's not full of riots. You might see some of that again on the news, but that's really not how it is in the US. I've never seen anybody carry a gun before. And I lived for, um, in total, 26 years in the United States. And not once did I see somebody carrying a weapon, okay? Um, you just have to know where to go, how to be safe. And that goes along with any international city that you travel to. Okay, now choosing your university. So this is really important because the United States is one of the biggest countries in the world. And because we have so many different higher education opportunities, you really have to put in the effort to narrow down your choices. So first things first, you should look at location. So the United States, as I've mentioned several times, is very big and the cultures vary from region to region. So if you're going to study in the East Coast of the United States, it's very different than studying on the West Coast of the United States, which is very different than studying in the Midwest of the United States. Um, so you need to find a location, a culture that suits your needs and interests, okay? Um, now, if you are really into technology, if you're really into fashion, if you like warm weather, I would highly recommend that you study on the West Coast. Um, if you're somebody that likes skiing, somebody that likes a more liberal community, um, somebody that wants to study a liberal arts degree, then I would definitely recommend that you look at the Southwest, like Colorado. Um, so you really need to narrow it down, and I recommend that you start by narrowing it down to two regions. For example, the East and the West Coast, or the Midwest and the South, um, however you want to narrow that down. And then you start looking at the academics. So each university is going to have different offerings of courses, um, major tracks, and minor tracks. Um, eventually, I'll go into what a BA versus a BS is, because this is also really important depending on the field that you want to pursue, as well as the um, professional opportunities that you'll have available once you graduate. Um, the next thing is class and university size. This is actually surprisingly important for most people. They don't always consider it when they start to pursue their applications, but a lot of students are extremely uncomfortable in a lecture hall of 300 students. Um, so they will initially attend a university that's called a, D, a, a D1 university, Division I, um, that's, for example, 10,000 students and above. Now that can be really intimidating, and if they don't like a lecture hall of 300 students, then they have to switch to another university. And some universities offer very small um, classroom sizes, so it can be anywhere from 10 to 15 students in a very intimate setting rather than 300 students in a lecture hall. Um, and last but not least, this should be most obvious, but you need to look at eligibility requirements as well. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, every university is going to be different. Like I said, in terms of the courses that they offer, the size and their eligibility requirements are no different. So if you are planning to go to Harvard, that has very different eligibility requirements than Northwestern than Madison, Marquette, et cetera. So you really need to um, consider that um, as one of the most important components of your application. Okay, this is something also important, um, and this is something that not a lot of international students are aware of, but there are two different types of universities in the United States. There's a public university um, and there's a private university, and public universities tend to be very large, okay? They're usually subsidized by the government, so the government will pay for them to carry out a lot of research um, in terms of medicine, engineering, etc. cetera. Um, and because it is subsidized by the government, um, usually people pay a little bit less in tuition. Private universities are just the opposite. So just as um, the name would reflect, 
Um, it, they do receive most of their funding from private um, sources. So alumni donations, um, grants, and tuition fees. So because part of their funding is based on tuition fees, the tuition is much more expensive. So I'll give you an example. Um, in my state, the university that I attended is called the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, it is the biggest university in the state. It's public. And as a Wisconsin resident, I paid about $5,000 per semester, just for tuition. Now, a private university in the same state um, costs about $20,000 per semester. That again is for an in-state student. For an out-of-state student, you could be looking at anywhere between thirty dollars and $40,000 per semester, um, which could be sixty dollars to $80,000 per year, okay? Um, now, this is a generalization. Not all private schools are going to run you that far in debt, um, but in the main, private schools do cost a lot more than public schools. All right, now eligibility requirements. This is one of the most common questions um, that I get from students. And as I have said, and I'm going to try to nail this in as much as possible, it's different from university to university. Um, to know more and to know the specifics, you're going to have to contact each one that you're interested in. Um, so I can't tell you right now what you need to score on your SAT or your ACT. I can't tell you if you're going to have to provide um, a letter of recommendation. I can't tell you exactly what they're going to require of you because that is dependent on their admissions board only. Um, so general considerations that you should carry are your academic performance first of all. So this is going to be proven by your transcript from your high school or secondary institution provider. Um, most applicants for undergraduate studies don't yet know what their grades are going to be when they graduate, but the university will allow you to submit predicted grades. So based on your past grades, um, the current level that you're at and where you and your teachers see yourself, you can submit those predicted grades. Um, your performance on standardized tests is also really, really important. Um, ACT and SAT are the two uh, very common standard tests that American universities will accept. Um, some universities will require you to submit a personal essay as well. Now, this isn't always the case. And for international students, some of these considerations may vary. And you may not have to provide a personal essay. Um, but if you do, if you've looked at a university that requires this and you want somebody to look it over, we do actually provide English lessons and one of our tutors would be more than happy to help with the structure, format, etc. of your personal essay. Um, letters of recommendation. Now this typically comes from somebody that is not your family or your friends. This would come from somebody that has seen you perform in either an academic or professional capacity. Um, so it could be your piano teacher, it could be your chemistry teacher that has seen you buckle down and really perform well in school. Um, something else that's very important in the United States, and not only for university, but also for jobs, is extracurricular activities. So they like to see that you have volunteer experience. They like to see that you've been the head of a student organization. They like to see that you have interests in becoming a more global and cultured citizen outside of just performing well in school. Um, and some universities, last but not least, might require an interview. This is not as common. Um, I, even as a domestic student, never had to have an interview with my university. But if you are looking to pursue maybe an Ivy League school, or if you're looking to enter a specific department or school on campus, such as architecture or engineering, um, they might actually require an interview of you. So this is something, again, um, you will have to contact each institution and they will be able to guide you. They usually will have a very friendly international office and they'll be able to tell you exactly what you need to submit by when and how. Okay, so this is another thing that I really want to hammer in for the international students. Um, a lot of countries do offer full scholarship programs for their nationals to study abroad. Um, a lot of these scholarships are only applicable to English speaking countries. But when I worked in the international office, I saw dozens and dozens of students um, from these scholarships below. A lot of the times these scholarships are only applicable to students that are pursuing a STEM major. So if you're in architecture, chemistry, biology, pre-med, um, those would all apply. Um, and sometimes it even applied to business. 
but you have to check with the Ministry of Education in your respective country to see if you would be eligible for, for such a scholarship. Um, but three of the main scholarships that I worked with were, were SACM, which is the Saudi Arabia Cultural Mission, and they provided a full scholarship um, with what could even be considered a mid-level salary in the United States. So they would receive anywhere between three to $5,000 a month in addition to their tuition being covered. Um, Ciencia Sin Fronteras is a scholarship that's provided by the Brazilian government. Um, so this is just another example. I don't know if there are any Brazilians here, but it's uh, translated to Science Without Borders. And again, this would be only applicable to um, STEM students. Um, but you can actually pursue an entire degree in addition to your graduate studies in the United States, in Europe, et cetera. Um, so highly recommend that you take a look at this. And it is also applicable to UAE students. And there are different scholarships from the UAE's um, Ministry of Education. Um, so look at their websites um, and definitely reach out to them and ask them if you have any questions. Um, but I also have a friend that studied in the United States through one of these scholarships. Um, received full accommodation, full tuition covered, and $5,000 a month um, for living expenses, which is more than enough to live in most cities in the United States. All right, now how to apply. So here's a general timeline. I'm not going to give specific dates because as I said, it could be different from university to university. Um, so I'll give generalizations. Um, so the first step, um, even prior to the first one listed here, is that you should start looking at universities and start narrowing them down 18 months prior to beginning your application at all, okay? Um, it might take you six months to do enough research to know that you want to study in New York or that you want to study in Wyoming or that you want to study in Georgia. Um, it might take you that long. And you will also, like I said, have to contact those universities, which could also be time consuming. Now, you start your application at least one year prior to the beginning of your first term, okay? Um, so if you're interested in pursuing a fall term, start in September of the year before that, okay? So you should be then entering your senior year, and that'll give you more than enough time to complete the application process. Um, so then you submit your online application form, you submit your application fee, you will have to provide evidence of English proficiency and your standardized test scores. You'll also have to submit your transcripts from high school or whatever secondary studies. Um, and then there might be additional requirements per university or department on campus to which you're applying. Okay, and this is something that in the United States is kind of confusing, but it's absolutely essential. It's actually a legal document called a FERPA. And you are not allowed to have anybody submit materials on your behalf unless you have one of these forms filled out with that specific person identified. Um, so it's essential if you want parents or friends to be able to submit information for you and also access any part of your university record. So um, your academic information, even your application is completely protected by this law. Um, and legally, we cannot as a university even disclaim that we know who you are. Um, because that would admit that we have affiliation with you. Um, so if you're looking to, let's say you have an uncle in the United States right now that lives close to the university that you're applying to, he cannot deliver transcripts to that university, he cannot deliver an application fee, everything needs to be submitted either by you, your high school, um, or somebody that you have listed on this protected document. Okay, now pre-application, obviously I told you, you have to narrow down your prospects, um, correspond with each university's international office. Each university is going to have an international office. They will all have different names, but they will be listed on the university's main homepage, okay? Um, each university has very large international population, so they have a specific office on campus that caters to these students. Now you'll also have to speak with each department or school on campus that you would like to participate in. So if you're not really sure what your major is yet, this wouldn't apply to you. But if you're entering university with a specific intent of entering an architecture program or entering a nursing program or engineering, et cetera, um, then you need to speak with that school on campus. Oftentimes these schools are very competitive um, you might even have to pay more tuition per month to attend them. For example, if you go to the business school at my university, 
um, you would have to pay an extra $1,500 per semester, which would actually gain you access to different um, places on campus. So um, you do have to correspond with each of these schools and departments as well. Now, when you talk to the university's international office, they will guide you towards these departments and perhaps provide you contact information for them as well. Okay, now I told you that I would go over what the difference is between a BA and a BS. All right, so that would be a Bachelor's of Science or a Bachelor's of Arts. Um, now, it's not exactly what it sounds like. If you're pursuing a Bachelor's of Arts, that doesn't mean that you're going to pursuing, you're going to be pursuing film or music. Um, it just means that you're allowed a little bit more flexibility with your academics and you're not going to be specifically studying um, every single course you take on campus towards your major. Most of them will obviously go towards your major, but you'll have a, a few extra classes that you can take to fulfill maybe even a personal requirement. You've always wanted to study Italian literature or something. Um, and with a Bachelor's of Science, you won't have as much flexibility in that regard. Um, it's usually for more specialized uh, majors or minors. So that would usually mean more credits. And it's intended for highly specialized fields. So this would be for those schools and departments that I was talking about, like architecture, nursing, engineering, etc. Okay, so then you submit your online application form once you know what university you would like to attend. You can either go through the common application, which would be the equivalent of the UK's UCAS, um, but unlike UCAS, it doesn't have all of the universities in the United States listed. So I always recommend to students that you familiarize yourself with each university's homepage and the standardized application form will be listed there. So it's actually a better way to start. Um, so you can submit directly through their homepage. Um, and once you have submitted your application, the international office will reach out to you with your new applicant profile and give you instructions for how to proceed. Then you'll have to pay an application fee. This is really easy, you won't touch much on this. Um, it usually runs between 25 and over $100. It will vary from university to university. Okay, now evidence of English proficiency. Um, the two major tests that are accepted by most universities are the IELTS and the TOEFL, okay? Um, now, as with everything else, each university is going to have its own requirements for an IELTS score, for example. So the university that I worked at required for undergraduate studies at least an IELTS score of a 5.5. Um, and if you're doing graduate studies, an IELTS score of a 6.5 or above. Um, however, there is the possibility to be accepted um, contingent on your complete, uh, completion of an ESL program, either on the campus or with an affiliated ESL institution. So if you receive a five on your IELTS at the university that I worked at, then you will be invited to pursue um, ESL on that campus. And then once you achieve a higher score on your IELTS, you will be able to attend full time as an undergraduate student. Okay, now your official transcript from your high school um, and your ACT and your SAT score. So your official transcript must be provided by your secondary institution. You cannot come in with a Xerox copy of your transcript and deliver it as a submitted material. The university will not accept that. It has to be um, sent through mail or through email by your institution, okay? Um, now, if it's not in English, you also have to submit a copy in English. So we do have a very diverse admissions team, but I can't guarantee that somebody is going to be able to read Arabic um, or read Georgian or whatever the script may be. Um, now, the ACT and the SAT score, um, this is actually commonly misunderstood by most students. Not all universities require that you submit this but it's extremely important that you at least give it a shot um, because even if the university doesn't require this, um, this will help you with general admissions, especially if you're looking at like architecture, engineering, um, because on the ACT, for example, or the SAT, um, not just your composite score is important, but the individualized scores for math and science are also going to be really important to an engineering school, for example. Um, it's also really important for scholarships and for ESL placement. So a lot of scholarships, and I'll go over them later, but scholarships will 
want to look at what you achieved on your ACT or your SAT score in order to determine your eligibility for that scholarship. Um, and it's always best to take the ACT and the SAT at least one year prior. So it, when you start submitting these materials, that's when you want to take your ACT or your SAT. Now, if you're interested in learning more, um, even more in-depth information about either one of these exams, we do have another lecture coming up next week um, at the same time, it's on Saturday at 1 p.m. So I do recommend that you attend that in addition to this lecture. All right, so deadlines. Most universities require that all of these documents be submitted at least 10 months prior to your intended first term, okay? So if you are attending in the fall, it's best that you submit these materials at least by mid-February. That's usually the deadline for the universities. Um, if you are planning to attend in the spring term, then you should submit your materials um, sometime in the summer. Usually late summer is a little bit difficult because the admissions offices or international offices are getting ready to prepare new students to arrive on campus. And it can be a trickier time, okay? Um, so if you, are looking at a university, you realize that you've already missed their deadline, late acceptance is possible sometimes. Some universities do extend deadlines, but I highly discourage anybody from relying on this um, because it's really dependent on the university's quota. It depends on how many students have applied that year and also on each individual admissions team. So I always recommend that you take a look at each university's deadline and abide by it to the T. Okay, so once you're accepted, that's amazing news, but you still have a lot of work to do. Sorry to say. Um, so I'm going to give you first a list of offices that are going to be relevant to you in your pursuit of information on campus. Um, so the first one is the Academic Advising Office. So you're going to want to reach out to this office with questions related to your major, your minor, credit loads, your academic track, etc. So anything related to your academics is going to be through this office. Um, any information about finances, that's going to go through the Bursar's office. So scholarships, if you have questions about financial aid, you want to prove to a scholarship that you're applying for, that you have paid tuition X, Y, and Z month, or what your tuition rate is, that will be through the Bursar's office. Now the Registrar's office um, is for co course enrollment. So let's say you have difficulty enrolling in a course that you'd like, um, or you have questions about which courses will be offered next semester, that's going to go through the registrar's office. And last but not least is the international office. So this office is going to be your main stop on campus, aside from whatever department you end up working with as your major. Um, so the international office is going to be responsible for helping you with immigration. It's going to be responsible for guaranteeing your admissions. And it also is going to be the responsible office for what I mentioned before is OPT and CPT, which is actually related to both your major and minor track and um, immigration, okay? Because you do need to have um, your immigration documents set if you want to pursue OPT or CPT. Okay, so the next thing that you have to consider, once you're accepted to a university in the United States, um, we do something called a placement test. And this is actually really unique. Um, I love this about universities in the United States, um, but they do give you the chance to place, they give you a standardized test because that's what we love in the US. They give you a standardized test that gauges um, your level in any particular topic. So let's say you have studied Italian before and you think that you are, you're way above Italian 101, but you want to pursue that um, as maybe your minor at the university. Well, you can take a placement test, and let's say you would consider yourself in second or third year Italian. If you take the test and you score high enough, you can actually um, leapfrog and start at junior or third year Italian. So that's actually what I did, um, just to give you perspective with Spanish. Um, it ended up being my degree, but I had taken Spanish all throughout high school. I had traveled to Spanish-speaking countries, and I knew that I didn't need to start at a 101 level. 
So I took a placement test and I actually, I did leapfrog into junior level or third year Spanish. And I received um, 15, what we call retroactive credits for this. Now retroactive credits are just exactly as they sound. Um, you receive credits for the information you already have prior to arriving on campus. Um, so if you place into junior level anything, you will receive credits for the courses you didn't even have to take. Um, now this will save you both time and money in the future. Um, and you usually take these placement tests um, right before you start university. So obviously you need these in order to um, request course enrollment and to speak with your academic advisor, but this will happen a couple of months before you start your first term. Now, AP testing. Some universities will accept high scores if you took AP classes in high school, and you can submit an AP score of a five, for example, but not all universities are going to accept that as retroactive credits. And not all universities are going to allow retro credits to be applied if you take a placement test and place high enough. Um, so this again, it's going to differ from university to university, um, but I think this is really important. And like I said, if you take placement tests and you receive retroactive credits, you can really save a lot of money. I saved a whole semester in tuition because typically the 15 credits, that's an entire semester's course load. And that's what I got just in retro credits for Spanish. Um, okay, so academic counseling. Um, this, like I said, is going to be your first step once you um, are accepted into the university. So you'll be placed with an academic advisor and you can either claim your major and minor already or you can claim that you don't know what that is yet. A lot of students in the United States have no idea what they're going to study when they arrive on campus. Um, so for example, somebody could be thinking about pursuing business but they take this really great anthropology course and all of a sudden that's what they want to study now. That's very common. Um, and with your academic advisor, they'll also guide you towards which lessons um, and lesson load you should be taking. Now I'm briefly gonna go over what credit hours are because I think that they're essential um, when you arrive on campus and for international students or students that are used to maybe um, the UK credit load or credit hours system, um, it is very different. So um, one class is usually the equivalent of about three to four credits. It depends on the course type, course difficulty, and if it's a lecture or a lecture and lab combination. Um, so usually for um, general classes, they will require that you do not only um, one hour lecture, but then in addition to that each week, you'll have a lab where you actually start to practice and apply what you've learned in the lecture. Um, so these lecture and lab combinations are actually usually four credits because they're more time consuming. Um, in order to graduate, you must receive between 120 and 128 credits. Um, it's recommended to take a load of 12 to 15 per semester, and you must be at least 12 per semester in order to be considered a full-time student. Um, and you can also take credits throughout the summer and the winter. So in the United States, we usually get about um, one month of a break during the winter, which allows you to do a full course. So you can receive three credits over the winter period. And over the summer, we get three full months off. So a lot of students can, that you can pursue up to three or four different courses, meaning you can do an entire semester's worth of work in the summertime. If you don't wanna do that, if you just wanna hang out over the summer, that is an option too. You don't have to take winter or summer courses. Um, some students do um, want to transfer some credit. So let's say you start at one university and you hate it, and then you want to go to another university that you think is going to be a better fit. You can definitely transfer a lot of those credits, um, but you should be aware that most universities require that you submit at least, or you complete at least half of your credits on the campus that is going to issue your diploma. So transfer credits are possible. Um, but it's not recommended that you do anywhere near 60 of them. Okay, now course types. Um, once you start enrollment, you're going to hear a lot about these three different types of courses. So you're going to hear about general education courses, which I think I've already mentioned at least once, your major and minor courses, and elective courses. So general education courses are required for each and every student. Um, so this is actually a very different system that the United States has. 
uh, but you are required to take a certain amount of credits in basic topics. So mathematics, science, language, etc. And this is meant to make you a more well-rounded student. Um, so in order to graduate, you have to take a culture course, you have to take a language course. Um, and again, this is just to make sure that um, once you graduate, um, you can display your alum status with pride and show the rest of the world that alum from this university can speak a foreign language, they can talk about politics, they understand culture, etc. Now major and minor courses are again exactly what they sound like. Um, these are courses that are going to go towards your major, towards your minor. Um, and most universities, um, they fluctuate in terms of how many credits they want to go to your major and how many they want to go towards your minor. Now, like I said, if you're doing a bachelor's of science, you'll probably be required to submit more major and minor courses than general education courses. Now, elective courses are just slightly different and elective courses are kind of fun courses, I would say. So you might receive anywhere, um, maybe close to 10 additional credits that you can pursue that have nothing to do with your major or minor. They would not qualify as a general education course. Um, so let's say you're an engineering student and you've always been really fascinated by film. You can take a film course. Um, at the university that I worked at, there was a Harry Potter course. Um, you can take a yoga course. That would only be one credit, but um, you can take physical <clears throat> education courses as well. Um, but again, you have a limited number of these. So I always recommend that if you do um, want to have fun with your elective courses, make sure it's something that you've been interested in for a while. So, all right. Now finances. So this is a big one. A lot of students um, hear that in the United States, um, tuition rates are very high. That is very true. Um, so in the United States, most local students do pursue financial aid. However, this is actually not applicable to people that are not residents. So I've had students ask me if they would be eligible for financial aid and the answer plain and simple is no, unless you are a resident and can prove residency in a state or if you have, for example, protected status like refugee status in the United States. Um, I think that many of you would probably not qualify for that. Um, so another way to gain finances is through scholarships, all right? Now, thousands and thousands of scholarships exist that equals billions of dollars worth of scholarships, and a lot of them are completely untapped. So um, I have heard of anything um, from critical lang language scholarships. So if you speak um, Mandarin, Arabic, um, Farsi, etc. Those are considered critical needs scholar or languages. So then you can receive a very hefty scholarship for that. Um, I've also heard of very strange scholarships like being left-handed or having freckles. Um, so like I said, there are thousands of scholarships and many of them are untapped because you would never think to search for a scholarship for being left-handed, for example. Um, now campus jobs, a lot of American students pursue this option, but it is an option at some universities for international students as well. So at the university that I worked at, um, international students were eligible for positions, um, but only on campus. You cannot seek employment off campus ever unless you pursue OPT or CPT. Now, again, about the campus jobs, they can be anything from a catering job on campus, working in a coffee shop, um, you could work at the bank on campus, you can work on any number of different jobs. All right, so like I said, now I'm going to go over what OPT and CPT are. Um, so OPT is actually called um, optional practical training, um, and CPT then is called curricular practical training. Now, optional practical training to start, um, it is work either um, through research or maybe a firm. It would be a full-time position um, before or after graduation. So you don't have to have graduated. You can apply for um, OPT after your first completed year of academic studies on the campus. It's field specific. So you need to make sure that whatever job or research opportunity that you're pursuing is related to your major. So you can't, if you're an engineering student, you can't work you know, with a film organization. 
Um, you can't do research in primatology. It has to be related to your specific fields or it won't be approved um, by either the university or by the US Department of State. Um, all right, so these are paid positions. You are eligible to be gainfully employed um, through OPT. And OPT usually lasts for up to one year with the possibility of extension if you're a STEM major. So it talks about the importance of, a, of STEM majors before when it comes to your um, scholarships that would come from your home countries. It's also important for OPT and CPT. So now curricular practical training. So this is a job or research opportunity that you could only do prior to graduation. Once you graduate, you can no longer do CPT. It's also field specific, has to relate to your major. Um, it is also a paid opportunity and it can be either full or part-time and it can only last for a year. Um, it will, however, the difference here is that it will offer credits towards your major or minor as well, unlike OPT. Um, so I do recommend that if you pursue studies in the United States that you look at this because a lot of students that I worked with, they pursued OPT, for example, um, and if they do it after graduation, they have already spent four years on campus um, and then they're able to do an extra year and sometimes two, three, four years if OPT is extended living in the United States. Now, if you do either of these options, you don't have to stay in the state of your university. So let's say you want to pursue CPT over your summer term, so that three month period of a break, you can pursue that. Let's say you're studying in Chicago and you're just sick of cold weather, you can go down to Miami and find a CPT opportunity as well. Now, if you're doing OPT, because you have such a long period of time to work with potentially, especially if you're a STEM graduate, you can pursue this in California, you can pursue it in New Orleans, you can pursue it wherever you'd like. Um, as long as it is approved by your university. Um, so this actually kind of involves a really complicated immigration process that you need to discuss with your university's international office as well. But highly recommend that everybody look into this. All right, so this is actually something that a lot of students have already asked me, a lot of tutoring club students, um, but how to find accommodation a lot of universities require, once you arrive, to stay in campus dormitories for upwards of one year. Not all universities will require that. So we have universities like NYU that would be in the middle of a city and they're considered more commuter schools. So they're universities that are big campuses and then there are other universities that are um, building stuff between other buildings in a bigger city. And those would be considered commuter schools because people commute in from different parts of a larger region. Um, now, non-commuter schools usually do require that you stay on the campus for at least one year. Um, the university that I attended required only one semester. The university that my brother attended required two years of campus dormitories. Um, and the university that my best friend attended it required zero. Um, so it really depends on the university that you apply to. Um, you will have to live with roommates as well. Um, most of the time dorms are um, usually shared between two or three different people. And then there's off-campus housing as well. Um, and this, I'm not going to go into detail about how to find off-campus housing. That's something that you'll need to do a little bit of research on your own. Several websites for this, um, and typically it's allowed after the first year, like I said. Um, okay, now campus culture. So this is actually the last part of my presentation, but campus culture is really unique in the United States. Um, it is really, it's iconic. You see it in a lot of movies, um, you see it projected in a lot of, um, in a lot of culture, um, we make sure that our studies are always the first priority. Um, so a lot of students, they are very diligent about their studies. They join study groups. They attend their professor's office hours. Now, if you don't know what that is, most professors provide a certain number of hours per week and certain days per week that they allow students to come in, basically knock on the door and ask any questions that they have. Um, so studies are extremely important and most students dedicate anywhere between 20 and 40 hours a week to just studying not including the number of hours per week that they physically attend class. Um, all right, so academics. Um, we have something called an honors college. Um, the honors college 
is an option for students that want to attend a bigger university, but they like an, a more intimate setting. Um, so this isn't for everybody. Um, if you're comfortable in a bigger setting, then I wouldn't recommend this. But the honors college option is a good idea for somebody that needs a more personalized approach to each of their classes. Um, and they will have the option then to do, for example, you have a chemistry class and then you have honors chemistry. So chemistry would be in a big lecture hall, honors chemistry would be in a more intimate setting. Now another thing that's really common in the US is what we call a dean's list. And a dean's list is for students that have shown um, academic superiority. So we calculate um, academic success by a GPA. So let's say you receive a 3.6 or 3.7 um, or anywhere close to a 4.0 you would be eligible for the dean's list on your campus. Um, now, the only real benefit to this is a pat on the shoulder. Um, your name is publicized along with a group of potentially hundreds of others, but you can add this to your resume once you finish, um, once you finish university, okay? Um, you also have honors that you can graduate with. Um, so once you, let's say you do dean's list every semester, all four years, you would graduate with what we call cum laude, um, graduate with um, honors, um, magna cum laude with high honors, and then summa cum laude with the highest honors. Okay, now study abroad is another thing. I wanted to slip this in here somewhere, um, but this is something that a lot of students, not just in the US, but worldwide, are pursuing more and more these days. Um, so study abroad is not just, not what I'm talking about now. It's not pursuing an entire degree in a foreign country. Study abroad can be anywhere from two weeks to doing an entire academic year in a foreign country. Um, so for example, the two week option would be applicable to your summer or your winter term. And the university that I worked at, our study abroad opportunities were really, they were really unique, uh, but you'll find these at every institution. They're usually faculty led and they are also topic specific. So a lot of our architecture students would be able to do a two week program in France studying the architecture of the city. Um, or they would be able to study urban planning in Cuba. Or they would be able to study engineering at the Mercedes plant in Germany. Um, so this is a really unique opportunity. It's not terribly expensive. Um, you get to earn college credit. And it again is something that you will definitely want to put on your resume. Um, one of my friends did a business program in Italy through the university that I studied at, and he got to have a sit-down meeting with Donatella Versace. Um, so it is a really unique option. You can do it anywhere from two weeks, like I said, to an academic year. Um, and actually, I'm going to be doing a lecture on this in, I believe, two weeks' time. More information to come. Okay, so the facilities. Um, campuses in the United States are huge. Um, so you will find gyms, dorms, libraries, restaurants and cafes, banquet halls, medical clinics, and um, also chapels. You'll be able to um, practice whatever faith you would like. Um, there's usually a mosque, a synagogue, and a church on every campus in the United States. If not, there will be a chapel where you can that welcomes um, students of all different faiths. Okay. Um, so, like I said, you will have all of these facilities at your disposal. Um, and you will also have to pay a segregated fee for this that's included in your tuition and your academic advisor will likely go over this with you um, once you arrive on campus. Sports. This is a huge part of um, American university life. We really like our sports teams. Sorry, there is a typo here, not our spots teams. Um, so this would include American football, basketball, what we call soccer, um, and lacrosse. So this image below is actually the university that I attended. This is our American football stadium. Um, and it's free for all students. It's paid if you're a visitor, um, but it actually adds a lot of funds to the university. Um, and like I said, um, it's a huge part of our university culture. So we actually have big national championships. We have the university equivalent of the Super Bowl for um, university American football. And we also have something called March Madness, which is um, university basketball championships in March. And it's even bigger. Um, I would say that it's actually a bigger deal than any NBA team championship, et cetera. It's the biggest sports event besides the Super Bowl in the US. 
Um, this right here, I just wanted to share a picture. Oops. Um, a lot of students in the U.S., they like to study outside. This right here is a picture of a cafe at my university where people like to study outside. This is a, a very com a common campus um, lawn where people used to study outside. So it's very open. Um, like I said, everyone's really dedicated to their studies, but there's also this really cool, unique um, environment, this really unique atmosphere to it as well. Okay, so resources. Um, these are just some websites that I recommend that you take a look at. Um, for university information and rankings, university information including university stats, um, major and minor offerings, etc. cetera. Um, my go-to website is topuniversities.com. Um, it gathers all of the university rankings uh, worldwide so it's not just american universities but you can type in institutions even here in uae that they would show their rankings um, on this website and studential is a, another really good source now both of these websites are also going to include articles about different topics on university life from what's going on with the covid19 um, study abroad um, you know comparisons between universities and their pre-med courses or in their engineering courses, etc. So highly recommend that you take a look at this. Um, scholarship websites. Now we do have two different scholarship uh, websites that are extremely popular. I would say more than anything, um, you should visit these two, fastweb.com and scholarships.com. Now with fastweb, you're going to have to do this only after you're accepted because they do require um, parts of your university profile. Um, but you will find, I think, the biggest, um, uh, the biggest list of um, American scholarships on this website. Now, we also have resources ourselves at Tutoring Club. Um, so we do, like I said, have the ACT and the SAT lecture coming up next week. We have SAT and ACT prep lessons. So if you're really concerned about your performance in a certain topic, um, I highly recommend that you take advantage of this, contact us, and let us know so that we can prep you for these standardized tests. Um, and also your admissions essay. If this is required by your university, then we can help you with that. We obviously have a lot of experience with essay writing um, and writing papers, so we're happy to help with this as well. And we do have a lot of tutors that um, have experience helping students in this area. Okay, so our contact information is listed here. Um, so now I will allow anybody that has a question to type it in the chat box. And I guess we only have two students. So if you guys would like, you can unmute yourself and we can discuss whatever questions you might have. No questions? Alex, do you have any questions? Let me take a look. I don't think we have any questions, to be honest. Sure, sure. Um, if you guys do have any questions, um, then I highly recommend that you email us, give us a phone call, um, or you can connect with me directly. I think most of you guys have my number anyways. So, all right, well, it was really nice speaking with you guys today. Um, if you have any questions in the future, if I've inspired other topics or questions that you were previously unsure of, please feel free to reach out and we will talk to everyone soon. So thank you. All right. Thank Have you good... guys. Bye bye. Sorry, I should have been a really good stooge and had like three questions lined up to kick that off, but I did not. We will remember that even if it is just an audio note. <laughs> Yes. Okay, hold on. I don't think I recorded. Oh, yeah, I did. You did. It's been recording.